Well, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Brandon McCaughey. If you don't know me, uh, I want to welcome you today, uh, whether you're joining us here in the building or, or online. And uh, it's, it's officially snowing out. It's lovely. I was standing out there, and I mean, it's Texas snow, you know. But uh, my boys are, are quite excited because it's the one thing they really miss from living in the mountains. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope you all just had a, an incredible, beautiful week. Uh, it's been a tough week, uh, like many of the weeks we've had of late. Uh, lots of ups and downs, but I hope that you know full well that Jesus Christ is still the Lord. Uh, he is still in control, uh, even when any, everything else out there looks like a big, dirty mess. Uh, and despite that storm that's swirling all around us, uh, I cannot think of a better opportunity for us as believers to live as the light in the darkness. And so I just want to encourage you today, uh, brothers and sisters, live as the light. Uh, be that encouragement, be that beacon of hope and truth uh, to this world that is frantically searching for it but is looking in all the wrong places. So last week we began a series through the book of Romans, which we've called Foundations. And we're continuing on, as you heard uh, from Kevin, um, in chapter 1 with verses 18 through 32. Some, some light verses, you know, very easy stuff. Uh, but open your Bibles with me, if you would, and let's uh, spend some time hearing what the Lord has for us today in His precious Word. And, and as you turn there, can I just invite you, church, to to go before the Lord with me and ask him to reveal to us his truth. Let's pray together. Father, you are our refuge and our strength. Uh, we want to run to you in times of trouble. We want to seek the truth of your word when we don't know the way. And Lord, we, uh, we confess as, as we've heard uh, these words, there's a lot of difficult stuff here. And yet I pray... Uh, Holy Spirit, that you would show us what you would have for us today. Uh, we want to be like you, Lord. We want to be a people who uh, stand firm on the truth, who live that truth out in this, in, in this world, and, and who run to Jesus for every one of our iniquities, every one of our sinful desires, because only he can free us from all of that. So we love you. We thank you for this time together. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So when we think about the wrath of God, our first response might be to scoff. Right? Well, you know, wrath of God. It's all right. Uh, the second response uh, to God's wrath, if we think about it a little bit more, uh, could be to shudder. Right? Ooh, I don't, I don't know if I like the wrath of God. But if you really sit down and wrestle with the deep truth that is the wrath of God and all that that entails, it should cause us as believers to be outright terrified. And yet, despite our initial apprehension, the wrath of God is actually an incredible gift to the believer. In it, we see sinners redeemed. We find the difference between right and wrong, and we, we know the difference between the two. And we have hope that there is, in fact, a better way to live than our own sinful nature that we so desperately cling to. A theologian named Stephen Davis uh, said it this way. He said, I think we ignore the concept of the wrath of God at our own cost. Indeed, I would argue for the radical proposition that our only hope as human beings is the wrath of God. It is also true, of course, that our only hope is the grace of God, but that is another matter. The wrath of God shows that we do not live as so many today suppose that we do in a random and morally neutral universe. God's wrath shows us that right and wrong are objectively real. They are to be discovered and not created. The wrath of God is our only hope because it teaches us 
the moral significance of our deeds and shows us how life is to be lived. Church, I want to jump right into our passage this morning. This uh, I have struggled with all week because there is so much stuff here uh, that I, I can't hopefully get through it all. But I want to jump right into our text and let's begin with Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 18, as we look at what the God's Word says about His wrath. Romans 1, 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You see, the story of the gospel is the story of God's redemption in setting us free from His wrath. A wrath that we deserved because of our own sin. And, and we talked a little bit last week how the gospel makes no sense without our sin and God's righteous judgment of it. Right? If we have no sin to be saved from, the gospel is irrelevant. Salvation has no significance in our lives. And if the wrath of God is undeserved or unjustified, then I'm serving a God who has brought to his people judgment despite their guiltless behavior. And then he is no longer worthy of being called Lord. But true, Paul is writing us about the truth that we are all sinners and we in our sin are deserving of the wrath and the punishment of God. And I think these truths are really, they're under attack today in the church. Uh, it's not possible uh, to, to hear messages where they've neutered the text and they've taken out anything that talks about sin or wrath or judgment for fear of hurting people's feelings. We've, we've, we've made that message palatable to the message because we've removed that the uncomfortable truth of God's wrath being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. We've taken that out. Because it's not acceptable to tell people that they're sinners. People don't like to be called sinners. We even kind of poke fun at those fire and brimstone preachers, you know the ones, uh, who teach often about sin and hell. But the more comfortable our culture becomes with sin, the more we hear things like people are basically good at their core, the more uncomfortable we become with the wrath of God. You see, it's easy to believe the lie that people are basically good and not sinful. That's comfortable for us. That God shouldn't really have anything against us. Why would, he, why would he punish me by bringing his wrath? I'm, I'm not really that bad of a person. But I would tell you, church, that not believing in the wrath of God does not lead you into believing in a God who is more loving, but less loving. The wrath of God is foundational in us understanding salvation, the gift of grace itself. And that's why Paul is going to spend so much time creating this foundation in Romans 1, 2, and 3. In verse 17, Paul tells us the righteousness of God is revealed. And then in verse 18, what comes next? After his righteousness is revealed, comes the wrath of God. You see, you and I, we are a people who have rebelled against God Himself, against His very Word. And every single human that has ever existed is guilty of this. No one is exempt. We are a people who suppress the truth through our unrighteousness. I think it's interesting that Paul doesn't say that we are ignorant of the truth. Paul says nothing about us being ignorant of the truth. He says that we know the truth and we suppress it. We hide it. We squash it down. He says we work to not let it have an impact on the way we live our lives. 
We justify our sin. We justify our behavior. And we say, well, God forgives, it's okay. Paul is showing us the lack of holiness in our thinking and in our believing, in our attitudes, in our priorities, in the contempt that we have for God's law. To humanity in its ungodliness and its unrighteousness does not ever run to God. It does not flee to Christ or embrace the gospel, but instead stands under the condemnation and judgment of that God that we have offended so greatly with our sin. You see, Paul is trying to make the case here in Romans chapter 1 that God's wrath is justified. That it is right for our God to be angry over sin. He is angry over our sin. Jerry Bridges writes this way. He says, God, by the very perfection of his moral nature, cannot but be angry at sin. Not only because of its destructiveness to humans, but more important, because of its assault on his divine majesty. This is not the mere petulance of an offended deity because his commands are not obeyed. It is rather the necessary response of God to uphold his moral authority in his universe. And though God's wrath does not contain the sinful emotions associated with human wrath, it does contain a fierce intensity arising from his settled opposition to sin and his determination to punish it to the utmost. God is holy and righteous, and His righteousness has been revealed. So He must punish sin. Because sin is an in, in affront to everything that God is. Now I realize that, that there's a struggle for some of us uh, to believe that God can't possibly love us and also desire to punish the sin within us. But the wrath of God, the anger of God towards sin is a function of His goodness and love. God's anger towards sin is a function of His goodness and love to us. N.T. Wright says it this way. He says, God's wrath properly is an aspect of His love. It is because God loves human beings with a steady, unquenchable passion that he hated apartheid, that he hates torture and cluster bombs, that he loathes slavery, that his wrath is relentless against the rich who oppress the poor. If God was not wrathful against these things and so many other distortions of the human vocation, then he is not loving. And it is his love determining to deal with that nasty, insidious, vicious, soul-destroying evil that causes him to send his only special son. You see, church, God's wrath against our sin is proof of how much he loves you. See, everyone in the world apart from Christ is under the rightful condemnation of God, and that's why God sent his son, Jesus, to be the savior of sinners. Now let's look together at verses 19 and 20. Paul writes this, he says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and His divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. You see, Paul is making it clearer and clearer as he goes through these verses that God's wrath is justified. It's appropriate. It's an appropriate response to the problem of sin. And he's, he's arguing that because we all know God we, and we still sin against Him, then His only response can be wrath. We have no excuse 
Because God has revealed himself to all people. There's no such thing in this world as an atheist or agnostic. They can call themselves that, but they're not really that. Because Paul is reminding us that God has revealed himself to everyone. You can't claim ignorance. Oh, I just didn't know that God was the Lord of all. I didn't know that that Jesus is my Savior. God has shown himself to every single person, and we all have this knowledge of God. Some might not just have an awareness of his existence, but we have all been given the knowledge that God himself exists. And Paul's reminding us that he's revealed himself to us through his creation. When we are able to, to look at God, what He has made, and we are able to see God's attributes, His power, His divine nature. Paul says, in the things that have been made. That's a stunning statement. You and I can go out into nature and we can see God for who He is. The snow that's falling on the ground is a revelation of who God is. That's why we look at it and we, it just it feels magical, right? Because it's a revelation of who God is to our hearts and our minds. And God's saying, look, here I am. And God's saying, I'm not just revealed in creation. I'm not just showing you who I am. But I have been clearly seen and understood through it. He's understood. We, we can know him intimately because of his creation. And because of this, Paul says, we stand before God without an excuse. We are created in the image of God. He has revealed himself to us clearly. We have understood him, and yet we still reject him. We still turn to our sinful desires. We have the law of God Uh, written on our hearts. But we are still unrighteous. Everyone without Jesus stands in clear and utter rebellion against God the Father. And no one can stand before God and say, I didn't know. I wasn't given a chance. There is never anyone who has existed in history that can say that because God has revealed himself to all. Now let's look together, church, at verse 21. Paul says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. You see, the true knowledge of God is suppressed in the hearts of those who reject God in in two ways. Uh, The first way, Paul says, by failing to realize the fundamental purpose for which God created you, which is to glorify Him. If you have the knowledge of God, if you know who God is and you don't give Him glory, you are failing in the primary purpose for which you were created. He created you to bring Him glory. And secondly, Paul says that that the truth is suppressed when we don't give God thanks. When we're ungrateful for what He's done for our lives, for our provisions, for our care, for His love. When we look at His gifts and we say, that's not good enough, God. Paul's reminding reminding us of the danger of getting to these places in our heart where we see the truth of God and He's revealing Himself to us and we still say, you know what, Lord? I don't want it. And in verses 21 through 23, Paul's going to continue and he's going to show us the consequences of suppressing the knowledge of God in these ways. Look what he says. He said, they become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they become fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals, and creeping things. You see, this is how people 
begin to suppress the truth of who God is in their lives. When the knowledge of God does not lead to the glory and worship of God, when that link is broken between knowledge on the one hand and belief and obedience on the other, our knowledge of God becomes futile. Right? Our hearts are darkened. The truth is hidden from us. And it breaks my heart when you hear people respond this way. Yeah, I know all that stuff about Jesus. I just choose not to follow Him. Their hearts are being darkened before your eyes. Their thinking is becoming futile right in front of your face. This is how people begin to suppress the truth of God. And when you begin to, to reject what God has revealed about Himself to you, it becomes easy for you to believe all sorts of ridiculous things. It doesn't matter how intelligent someone is, because plenty of smart people believe things that are ridiculously contradictory to what God's Word has told us. Look around. And they, they've convinced themselves that they're right. But Paul is saying that they haven't convinced themselves. He said God has given them that. He's turned them over to that because that's what they truly wanted. You see, the consequence of this kind of thinking is that our hearts become darkened and unreceptive to the truth. You ever tried to share the gospel with someone and you just feel like you're banging your head against the wall? This is why, church. Because in their sinful disobedience, God has said, fine, have it your way. And it gets harder and harder for them to accept what God has been showing us, how he's been revealing himself to us. And over time, our hearts become more stubborn, more hardened to the reality of what God has revealed is true. We become blind to the things that God has shown us so clearly in his word. You wonder how people can read God's Word and, and think crazy things? This is why. And it causes us to make compromises in our worship and in our conduct. How often do we see this in our world? The foolishness of this world stubbornly claiming to be wise, unashamedly approving of things that are evil and wicked, we can make a list. We love to invent ways to reject God and suppress His truth and to come up with our own truth. And my prayer is that may, God might enable us to see when we get stuck in these kinds of errors, when we get stuck wandering away from the truth of His Word and what God has revealed to us about who He is and flee to the only answer for that kind of folly, Jesus Christ Himself. Now let's look together at verse 24 and 25 because Paul is going to tell us what happens with this sort of stubbornness. He says, Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I like that he throws that little who is blessed forever. Amen. And that, that's, it's not all dark, right? Paul reminds us, church, that one of the ways that God brings judgment against our sin is by giving ourselves over to it. Now this is, this is difficult. Uh, because what, why does God say to a human heart that says, I rebel against you, God. I want to be my own God. I want to do it my own way. God says, fine. You can have it your way. You can do it the way that you want. And he gives them over to that debased mind. Right? Uh, church, and this is, this is why we have uh, 
struggles with addiction. Because after running to that addiction again and again and again, God finally says, okay, if that's your God, so be it. If that's what you hold most dear and most precious in this world, you can have it. See, God doesn't want to force you and I to worship and love Him. It's why C.S. Lewis said that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. Those that are stuck in their sin don't want to leave. They don't want it different. It's what they have chosen. Because they love their sin, they prefer their sin to a relationship with God. And God in His, in his mercy and in His loving kindness gives them over to that sin. Because it's not true love if He forces you. And He knows that for some of us, we have to be a little like the prodigal son. And maybe it's a mercy for him because he knows that that is the path that will bring us back to him. But I think as you look around in our, in our society today, it's, it's interesting to see God punishing us for our sinful disobedience. Because the wrath of God is being revealed not in our destruction, but in giving us what we've wanted all along. He's giving us the sinful desires that we've longed for in place of Him. And that's why our world looks like it's fallen apart. Because God has broken loose the restraint of sin in our society and He's letting sinners have it their way. This is true of, of every culture that's existed. Right? The wrath of God comes to us when He delivers us into the hands of our own desires. The pervasive sin in our society isn't waiting for the judgment of God. The pervasive sin is the judgment of God. God is willing to let you and I have what we love the most. And the judgment of God is going to come when he says, fine, I'm done fighting with you. Have what you love the most and be free. Now look with me at verses 26 through 32, and this is a big section, but he's going to use this section to show us our depravity, the depths of our sin, uh, and how much we need the grace of God. Now listen to this. He says, for this reason... God gave us, gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. So they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now church, this passage should remind us that in our sinful state, we don't become more free. We don't become more human. We become slaves in bondage to our sinful desires. We have nothing to stand on without Christ other than our own righteousness, which, which Paul already told us is a filthy rag. It's nothing. 
Now, I want to point out here, because I think a lot of Christians get stuck on some of these verses. Paul is not picking on one particular group and saying, these are the sinners. These are the ones who really need the gospel. This is the issue you should really be concerned about. He's saying, find yourself on this list. Because you're on there a bunch of times. We're all on there a bunch of times. That's the point. Look at how extensive is our sin. It affects every person equally. And the only thing that stands between us and our sinful desires is the grace of God himself. Paul is saying, look at our society. Look at the the sexual deviance. Look at the hatred and the lies and the corruption and the incomparable ways that we we dishonor our Creator, the inventive ways that that we learn to sin. We're creating new ways to sin all the time. And he's saying, look at how desperately we need the grace of God. And I think it's easy when you read a list like this to just point your finger at everyone else. But Paul is pointing the finger at you. He's pointing it at you and saying, this is you. And he's reminding us of what every single one of us would be like apart from the grace of God. Apart from the love of Jesus Christ. And apart from his salvation. You see, it's easy for us to look at a list like this and think some of these things are worse than others. At least I'm not one of those. But the truth is, church, that God does not accept any of us as we are in any amount of sinfulness. One little small white lie, if that's even a thing. And you are equally guilty to the murderers on this list. Your gossip and your slander of your neighbor isn't any better than idolatry. Your sexual sins and your perversions that you you try and hide from God aren't any different than disobeying your parents. Not a lot of kids in here, but this for you and for me. Paul is saying that the problem is not out there. It's in here. And he wants us to desperately remember what our state is without the grace and mercy of God. That we were standing justifiably under the wrath of God. See, I think it's interesting that Paul is the one writing this. Because Paul was a murderer. And Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus. And, and it doesn't say that he approved of Paul's sinful lifestyle. And this is, this is a little bit of the juggling game here, church, of where we have to land on this issue. We are not to approve the sinful lifestyles of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus loved Paul too much to to allow him to continue on. He he brought him instead into a life that rejected those sinful desires and sought him to become more like himself. That's why Paul reminds the Galatian church to bear one another's burdens as we struggle with sin. He says in Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's not approval. It's struggling together. Because this struggle for sin is one that we all bear. And every single believer can look back at this list and say, yeah, I remember when I was that. I might have struggled with that this week. And we can go back and we can see 
God's, God's loving kindness, His steadfast love, His patience and His mercy towards us, maybe over years and decades. And Paul reminds us that just because you were a sinner doesn't mean that that's who God has called you to be. That there's a better way. Look what he writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Again, it's a list we can all find ourselves on. But this is the key. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul's reminding each one of us we were all there. We were all folks who did not stand a chance, who were not going to inherit the kingdom of God because we stood under His wrath, justifiably so. But with Jesus, we're washed, sanctified, justified, and made clean. See, we are a people who need to be washed and sanctified by the precious blood of Christ. It's our only hope. And Paul's reminding these Christians, before the grace of God took hold of your lives, you too were living in sin and in unrighteousness. But look at what the power of the gospel can do to transform a life like yours and a life like mine. Look at the power of the gospel. There is no sin so horrible that it's beyond the grace of God. The transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ can change anything and anyone. Church, we know that this world is broken and sinful. And we need the grace of God that can be only found in Jesus Christ. And the wrath of God is a gift. It's a gift to us because it shows us how necessary is the gospel. R.C. Spall, he reminds us this. He says, there are only two ways that God's justify, justice can be satisfied with respect to your sin. There's only two ways. Either you can satisfy it or Christ can satisfy it. You can satisfy it by being banished from God's presence forever. Or you can accept the satisfaction that Jesus Christ has made. Those options seem pretty one-sided to me. And if you're a sinner at church, and if you don't belong to Christ, you stand under the wrath of your God. And you can choose to pay that penalty yourself. Because the penalty will be paid. You can stand condemned, and one day He will cast you away from His presence forever. And you will experience what life without the presence of God actually looks like. Or you can come before the Lord in humility, recognizing the depths of your sin. Crying out to Him, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. See, only in submission to Jesus can a heart like, like yours or mine be transformed. Only in submission to Jesus can we be changed. And God offers that gift of righteousness to all who believe in Christ Jesus. And with His righteousness, with Christ's righteousness covering you, the wrath of God no longer stands over you. You're free from it. Instead of punishment for your sin, you will receive a crown of glory. Instead of shame, you are given hope. And instead of death, you are offered eternal life. And instead of separation from God, 
You were given life in His presence forevermore. So flee from God's wrath, church. Run to Jesus and take refuge in His gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank You for Your wrath. As awkward as that is to say, Lord, we know that it shows us who we are. It's like a mirror that teaches us that our own righteousness is is nothing. That we can't be saved or redeemed without Jesus Christ. But it's in Him that we desperately cling. Father, I pray for all the hearts in this room that are that our cry today would be, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. And then in that forgiveness, we would rest and we would have peace knowing that we have been washed clean by the blood of Christ and that our sins are no more. That you cast them as far as the east is from the west. And we stand justified in your presence longing for the day when we will dwell with you for eternity. Father God, your, your wrath is a gift of love. It shows us how much you deeply care and love us, your children. May we not be afraid to stand on that truth and to hold fast to our anchor, Jesus Christ. To him be all the glory all the power and all the honor forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins they
people appointed for wrath. You've been appointed for salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. He lived a holy life so that you could have His righteousness. He died on your behalf so that you could have His life now and forevermore. Be encouraged and rejoice in the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. Have a wonderful week, High Point family. Don't forget how much we love you.